let me now transition to the next panel where we're going to hear from two uh, amazing uh, people, Reed Hoffman and James Manika. Reed is one of the world's most accomplished entrepreneurs, Silicon Valley's ultimate connector and a partner at Greylock Ventures. He co-founded LinkedIn and serves on the boards of Airbnb, Microsoft, and many other companies. Also joining us is James Manika. James has been thinking about AI's effects on the economy longer than most of us, going back to his doctoral work in artificial intelligence at Oxford. He's a senior partner at McKinsey and chairman of and director of the McKinsey Global Institute. And he's also a member of McKinsey's board. Welcome, Reed and James. Great to be here. Um, uh, I thought I think I'll cut, I'll kind of kick off with a few comments, um, and then uh, we'll go to it. Some of these may be hopefully not too repetitive to all of the excellent work that Eric's been doing, because I'm uh, definitely well informed by both Eric and James on a lot of these topics. Um, so this may be a little duplicative. Uh, hopefully not. But, you know, I mean, look, one of the, uh, it, it's not new that technology amplifies productivity, right? Classic case is uh, the industrial revolution from agriculture. But what is new is that technology is going through faster iteration. Um, previously, uh, you kind of had almost like punctuated equilibrium, you know, to kind of borrow from the Stephen Jay Gould, right. you know, biology thing where you kind of had a big jump, right? And it was stable. And so you reorganized to, to what was stable. Now, it is very clearly today and line of sight to that, that transformation happening within the generation of a lifetime, of a work, of, of, a, of a person's uh, career. And so that makes it much more unstable because it isn't just a, okay, let's figure out the new equilibrium, let's set out the new pieces, let's set out all the old, old channels. It now actually, in fact, requires a certain amount of dynamism. Uh, similarly, um, and this is you know, part of the, 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 one of the things I learned from James and, and the excellent work at, at McKinsey, it's adaptive to a new set of tasks. It isn't like, well, these jobs are automated, right? And these jobs are not. There's actually, in fact, a whole set of tasks, which a few jobs become completely automated, a bunch of jobs become transformed, and relatively few jobs have, have, have smaller impact. And so that has a much broader range. It's things that are traditionally white collar, um, also a higher skill uh, bar in terms of uh, you know, working with these machines is, is no longer kind of the, you know, learn how to, 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 to drive a tractor, right, or something else. It's, it's actually, in fact, a whole different set, and it's changing at this acceleration, so you have this within a, within a work. What's more, with globalization, the pace is, is, is more set by technology, because you have not just kind of competition within companies, but national competition, and competition of companies and industries across countries, which means that you that while there's a, no, there's a kind of a typical political impact or political will to say, well, let's slow it down so we have slower transformation, that's most likely to lead to disadvantages to the countries and regions that do that, right? They try to say, hey, let's try to keep the jobs exactly the way they are. And then what you do is you're gonna push the wrinkle down a decade and it's gonna be much, much worse and harder to get back from. Um, and, you know, like a personal example of this is um, when I was early measuring this, I went to Shenzhen for a, um, uh, you know, for a trip where I was pretending, uh, we had a thing that we wanted to manufacture, but I was kind of shopping for what they could manufacture. And the biggest surprise that I had for my Shenzhen trip was that um, the, the manufacturers, I was thinking they'd say, oh, we're cheaper, right? And actually, in fact, what they do is that we're more skilled. Like we, we've been learning through the integration of technology, we're more skilled. So that piece of manufacturing is really easy. You can do that in the US, you should go to the US. Ah. This part is hard, they can't do it in the US, so you should do that with us. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, that was not what I was expecting, <laughs> right? And, you know, and, and what you learned about all this um, as part of it. And so, um, and, and so, you know, one of the, 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 the question is, you know, it's not just that it's job automation, but it's task automation. And what do we do? And, you know, my own personal point of view is if you want manufacturing back in the U.S., you, you, you want to speed towards robots. You want to speed towards technology because that's the thing that will give us a chance to get, for example, manufacturing jobs uh, back in the U.S. So um, even without the tech amplification, I mean, my first book was The Startup of You, which right. was um, essentially you know, kind of like, you know, we all have to be entrepreneurs now. It's no longer a career ladder, a career escalator. It's a, it's a jungle gym and be the entrepreneur of your own thing. It's amplified by the tech, right? As, as, as part of what we're doing. And so, um, and so, you know, what we, we, we need places like 
the digital economy lab desperately because the old patterns of like, we'll figure out the new equilibrium and just do it. That doesn't, that doesn't essentially work anymore, <laughs> right? What, 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 what you need to do is say, well, what is dynamic? What does the dynamic system look like? What is, what, and what are the, the, the interventions that look like this from, from kind of multiple stakeholders? Because it's not just I, I describe the economy it is, is now, where is it going? What are companies doing? What are international agents doing? What kinds of technologies are coming onto the floor? You need a, a, a network hub, right? And obviously the digital economy lab being at Stanford HAI, being within Silicon Valley, because the, 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 the two technology clocks within industry tend to be most heavily driven by China, <laughs> right? And by uh, Silicon Valley. And so it's one of the really central things. And Stanford, of course, recognizes China. So has, uh, you know, Beida and other kinds of things to try to get a, a, a much broader range of, of kind of understanding of this. Um, and, you know, part of the reason we need to do this is because, you know, saying this as the industrialists and the venture capitalists, look, the, the companies are trying to realize their market opportunities. And yes, they try to be good to society and they try to be good for humanity and they're, they're mission oriented. And that's really important. And by the way, people undercount how much that really is true for a lot of these companies, mm -hmm. but that's not like the product or service to market. And we need folks like the digital economy labs and, the, and, 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 and Eric and James you know, and, and, and the whole set of people in the whole network around the Digital Economy Lab to be saying, hey, here's some key questions. Here are things to do. Like one of the things that HAI is already doing is innovating within what is the ethics cross-check for AI technology? What are the questions that you need to do? How do you validate that? That's already been in process and, and it's kind of super important. And so, you know, what are those targets are exactly the kinds of things that I think, you know, make, you know, the Digital Economy Lab events like today, <laughs> right, and so forth. Uh, really important. And so um, I'll just end with um, uh, a couple of, uh, of, of, of quick thoughts and then we'll kind of go to conversations since, you know, I don't want to feel like I'm, you know, monopolizing the panel. I just wanted to kick it off. <laughs> and so, um, you know, part of the thing is you have to look at when you say, well, these are creating the challenges. You have to have the curve of the solution meet the challenges. So you can't just say, oh, look, we have this accelerating technology that is gonna cause all this disruption and change. And now we have this different way that the topple rate for you know, S&P 500 is gonna accelerate and, and, and jobs are gonna change within a career and, and so forth. And you go, okay, what are the solutions? And you have to say like, okay, well the time and the, uh, the time coefficients and the solutions need to match the problem. So we need technology to do that. We say like, well, how can AI help with kind of reskilling or how can AI help with, you know, kind of job matching, right? You know, obviously, you know, or what can platforms do to help create the jobs and the work? I mean, obviously it's one of the reasons why I founded LinkedIn. One of the reasons I frequently talk about the Airbnb magical trips as an example to, you know, not be too parochial about LinkedIn <laughs> in terms of how these things are working, but it's, it's, it's the, the solution set has to work in the same kind of time frames, the same kind of curve, the same kind of, uh, of, of, of things as what's creating the, the, the problems. And the very last thing is, you know, most often the things that are most terrifying or concerning also create the most interesting opportunity, the most interesting kind of utopic upside. So we got like, oh, oh my God, we have this massive change in productivity because of technology and globalization. Well, okay, lots of good can come from that too if we can get the game right. <laughs> and and that's I think why um, you know we're 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 here to play in you know in simple sports analogies offense not just defense uh, in terms of what to do and that's that's the kind of the final thing that I would say about why the 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 the, the digital economy lab is so important because part of that recognition is how do you play that offense in the in the right way and and hopefully that was that my my job for 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 kicking it off for. Yeah. <laughs> that was amazing, Reed. Uh, so much to chew on there. Well, I hope we can get to, to some of those items. It's just uh, just uh, wonderful. I'm glad this is on tape so I can go back and, and read it at, at, uh, or listen to it at, at half speed and keep up with you. Um, but uh, and, and thank you for helping to, to launch the Digital Economy Lab and, of course, and Stanford High as well. You played a, a big role in getting that underway and, and the issues there. Um, let me pick up on, on, well, there's a number of things that you can pick up. Let me pick up on, on what you said about China and what we can learn from them. And you know, you, you talked about keeping up um, with our institutions and our skills with a rapidly changing technology. Um, you know, are there things that China is doing well that we can learn from? Are there things that they're doing wrong? And, and, and you know, you're not just a Silicon Valley person, but I know you spend a lot of time over there as well. Um, definitely in a, a few ways. I mean, for example, I mean, there's, by the way, there's things that we have 
uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley in the US, if we don't squander them, that actually have unique competitive edge. Uh, immigration, yeah, we've, right, we've we do that much better than China. <laughs> right. For a long time, yeah. Yeah, we have, um, China is developing its universities at a very fast rate, but we have great universities, right? And things that use, there's, there's a bunch of stuff we have. It, like, it, 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 and it's good. Like we, if we make each other better, it's what, what competition is aimed for. But what I would say, um, the things that I've seen from China are um, a, a kind of a willingness to continue to act like as immigrants, um, even though they don't really have immigrants and kind of the, the like, let's try it. Let's have multiple shots on goal. As an example, when I was looking at um, how Tencent created WeChat, because I was like, okay, so here is the current best example of messaging client as a platform because the creation of these platforms are part of how you launch new businesses and how you get amplification and you know that kind of stuff and like if you say platforms for new industries like Airbnb or magical trips or you know potentially what's happening with LinkedIn these are part of the platform of what is the creation of future work and so I was looking at at WeChat and one of the things they did which I thought was really interesting and I put in blitzscaling mm -hmm. as part of like one of the the book for as part of one of the lessons was that um, they said, okay, well, we're going to set up multiple groups competing with each other, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And, and it isn't that like the groups that lose get fired, they just get retasked to other things, but the group that wins gets the messaging platform in the future. Because they had previously done this, this product called QQ, which was a desktop messaging thing, right. and they didn't have anything on mobile. And WeChat like, like was built by the guy who did QQ, so, but there was a couple other ones competing as well. And and then it just it, it's the it's the it's it's the it's the dial tone of messaging in China, and that dial tone is also payments, right? And and platforms for games and a bunch of other stuff. So that kind of thing is like one of the things I'd say uh, learning from China. The other thing that I would add, like when I came back from my Shenzhen trip, I was hoping that um, like I'm still thinking about how do we create special economic zones that essentially can work in the U.S. And you know, I was like, well, could we do like, for example, some kind of partnership with Mexico and do something along the border or, some, or something within some state that say, hey, here we have a special economic zone and let's run the experiments as opposed to try to pre-program it so much. Let's say, let's try this here, this here, this here and see which one of them is actually working well and, and accelerate. Those, those are kinds of things that I thought was like brilliant from what I was seeing in China that you know, we could learn from. Well, great list, and, and we'll, we'll get on trying to understand some of those better. Let me bring uh, James into the conversation. Uh, James, uh, you're as well positioned as anyone to, to bring together some of the research. You spent a lot of time with, with senior executives. Um, what, what's your current outlook for the future work? Some of these, these amazing technologies we're seeing, um, what, what are you seeing on the ground today um, in, in the changes in the economy and in companies? Well, th th thank you. It's fabulous to be part of this conversation. Well, the future of work, uh, boy, that's a big topic. Um, so I think, you know, uh, just to build on something that Reed said, it's actually important to think about this study from the activities and tasks up, as opposed to starting with whole jobs. I mean, any of the things that any of us do are made up of a constituency of 20, 30 different tasks. So when you look at what these AI and automation technologies are doing, they're kind of... Um, having a different impact on different parts of those task composition that make up your job, my job, anybody's job. So when you look at that in an aggregate sense across the entire economy, here's a rough picture that emerges and I would summarize it as kind of jobs lost, jobs gained, but also jobs changed. Mm -hmm. So jobs lost are those occupations where the majority of the tasks could actually be, are being automated and could all be automated over the next decade or so. And when we looked at that, what we basically found was that that's only about 10% or so of occupations. Then you've got the jobs changed. We know that whenever technology impacts the economy, and this has happened over decades and decades, we always create new jobs. So actually two things happen. Some existing jobs grow, but also we create some new occupations. So the combination of that kind of gives you the jobs gained part of that story. But I think as Reed pointed out, there's the jobs changed part of the story, which is actually in some ways the bigger story, because what happens is that for most occupations, we actually found, for example, that something like 60% of occupations have roughly about a third of their constituent tasks that can be automated. So mm -hmm. that tells you that more jobs are actually gonna change than will be lost. And that's part of what we need to deal with. Now, if you say how much of this is playing out in the economy today, well, a few different things. Uh, by the way, 
the economy right now in terms of jobs is kind of complicated because one of the things that's fascinating is that if you look over the last two decades, we've actually created a lot of jobs, actually, in terms of net jobs over the, over the first 20 years of the 20th century. However, a few things have happened. We've had, uh, if you like, inequalities widened. Uh, uh, you know, there's much, much more polarization in the labor markets in terms of people who are high skilled, high education are doing extraordinarily well, whereas people who are the opposite of that not doing as well. So there's a massive kind of uh, polarization. And in some ways, work has become a little bit more fragile. And that's also that's mostly a function of the fact that many of the new jobs we've created have actually been in kind of alternative arrangements. So while that has worked out okay, it's also increased fragility. So that's kind of where we are today. What do you mean by fragility? You mean like that, that they're not as likely to stay in the job for a long time? Uh, yeah, so fragility in a couple of ways that, you know, length in job is much more, uh, is typically shorter. And that's often for good reasons, by the way, but also can be for challenging reasons, either because it's contingent work, part-time work, uh, you know, uh, zero labor contracts and so forth. So fragility in that sense, but also that has an implied fragility in terms of the wages and incomes. There's a lot more variability in what people earn, particularly if they're in kind of these alternative work arrangements. Again, both on the upside, but also potentially on the downside. So the fragility has gone up, even though we have more jobs. So you put all, put all that together, that's where we are today. Now, if you, the other point I think I should make out, by the way, when it comes to work, and we see this across the country, I happen to be uh, co-chairing California's Future of Work Commission, Yep. But we've also looked at this across the United States. So there's, if you look across the roughly 3,149 counties across America, and you look at the micro labor markets is what's happening in, in all those counties across the country, you roughly get a picture of about a third, a third, a third. There's a, there's a third of the country where job growth has been spectacular. In fact, that third of the country has, has delivered something like two thirds of the job growth we've seen since mm -hmm. 2008. So those, those counties that make up a third have done spectacularly well. You have another third where job growth uh, and, and has been kind of muted. It's been slightly positive, but mostly muted. Uh, so it's kind of been okay. Then you've got another third where quite frankly, job growth has continued to decline. And so when you look across the country and it's sort of quite as simple as urban rural, of course, there's some, uh, some, some truth to that. But you also have some rural counties that are doing spectacularly well. For example, counties where you've seen fracking activities and other things. So you, what, you, what you end up with is a mosaic across America where it really is, you know, the different outcomes by uh, social income group uh, demographically that way, but also by geography. That's where we are. Then you layer on top of that the long-term trends about automation. So unless we do something about skills and education yeah. and even the wage impacts, it doesn't go in a good direction. Throw in the fact that COVID has made some of these things even more, even worse, right? So what, what has COVID done when, from a work standpoint? It's probably exposed some of these challenges even more. So for example, we know that of the roughly one third of American workers uh, who are vulnerable in an economic sense, so vulnerable in the sense of either they've been laid off or furloughed or experiencing reduced work hours uh, or reduced wages. It's about a third. Of that third, fully 80% of them earn less than $40,000 a year. So it's mostly impacted people who are low, relatively low wage workers and we also know that most of the ones who have been impacted in that vulnerability sense have less than a college education. So this has had, COVID has had disproportionate impacts on lower wage, lower skilled workers. And most of them are disproportionately people of color. So we've had this disparate impacts. Yeah. So COVID has kind of exposed these real future work yeah, challenges. No, it, it, absolutely, it's, it's amplified. I mean, I mean, you think about it, the, the kinds of people who can continue to work, are, like we are right now, are people who mostly work with information, information workers, knowledge workers. A lot of us have been able to transition to, to Zoom and email and Slack and, and haven't necessarily missed a beat. Some of us, I think we like, I'm, I'm more productive at having to spend less time commuting and other things. But if well, you're- I actually, you know, Eric, you know, you know, fun, I'll give you a fun fact on that. Yeah. So we all talk as if, where everybody, the whole world is working from home. That's actually not true. If you look across the US economy, various economists have made estimates about this. Our estimate says roughly 
at most a third of people can actually work from home. The other two thirds actually have to show up someplace physically to do their work. So it's, the whole world is not working on Zoom. Well, well, though that's exactly my point <laughs> is that, that there are people who are knowledge workers, information workers who can do a fair amount of that. But there are a lot of people either in manufacturing and work with physical objects and, and heavy equipment or um, you know, personal, interpersonal interactions that require them to be, you know, whether it's caregiving or other kinds of activities. And uh, in our economy right now, the first group was already paid more. And now uh, the COVID has, as you say, widened the gap. Uh, a lot of people in the second group are unable to do their work or have been laid off or furloughed or, or had other uh, restrictions. And so that's, that's amplified some of the issues. But as you also point out, with a lot of uh, very uh, great facts and figures, I can always count on you, James, to have the, uh, the facts for us. Um, a lot of these trends have been going on for a long time now. And uh, the, the COVID was a particular shock, maybe the biggest change since, uh, since World War II in, in some aspects of changes in the workplace. But it's part of a, a broader trend of technology changing the kind of work we're doing. You described all those jobs that are changing and you touched on the need for, for reskilling and, and, and issues, but I'd like to maybe let's dive in a little bit more about how we manage that transition. How do we um, find ways not to slow the technology down, but to speed up the adaptation of people and our companies and our organizations. And either of you, you know, Reed or, or James, if you want to try to, to sketch out a, a blueprint for what we need to do or, or how we start answering that question. Well, um, as I was saying a little bit in the early thing, I actually think slowing down uh, technology, um, generally speaking, is the wrong metaphor, the wrong strategic approach. Shaping it, um, saying, hey, uh, this goes, this is a much better uh, direction in terms of plus minuses, adaptation of society, that kind of stuff. And so I think you want to uh, actually, in fact, like, for example, you'd say, well, we've got this transformation of tasks and jobs. The question is, well, could we make some of those tasks and jobs um, easily adaptable to, uh, like, like the new ones are easily adaptable by people? Can we create technologies that enable that adaption to be earlier? I mean, like, for example, I, you know, a, a concrete thing was like, well, could we make AI to have uh, kind of skill tutoring um, or, or kind of matching skill tutoring? Because, you know, like one of the things is there's, you can actually learn a surprising number of kind of, of, of how to things from watching videos like that are on YouTube, oh, and so you go, right. okay, you know, yeah, can 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 I then be aware of them and find them in in a much better way, and then be able to do that in various ways? Do we transform this kind of industrial like diploma idea to kind of this is one of the earliest posts that I did on edu on the education to a much more dynamic uh, kind of skills certification? So mm -hmm. you go, oh, I have these skills, and that's what allows, and that's for example one of the ways that. You know our our society is uh, is 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 insufficient um, with with regard to racial economic justice, is that when you go too much towards towards the uh, credentialing, you tend to have um, you know poorer communities, people of color, so have all the talent, right? But but not that particular credential, and so you go no no, no let's let's create a new broader based kind of skill credentialing system that enables to do that, and all of those things are technological things we can do. So. Oh, Are you sorry, go ahead. More, more focused, like uh, nano degrees, that kind of thing. Yeah. Is, is that have in mind? Yeah. 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 So nano degrees, but also you could imagine, look, this is, again, you know, like I, I think a lot in terms of LinkedIn just because it's, it's it's the work, right? In Or one part of the work. And, you know, part of the thing is you say, well, you could he have here is actually, in fact, look, what is what is a certification? The certification is um, source X asserts that that entity Y, person Y can do Z. <laughs> right, roughly. Well, you can have a much richer language of that. You could just think of like a skills markup language or a certification wow. markup language <laughs> that says, here's what it is because it's now available in this way. And it could be computational readable and it could be matchable to different kinds of jobs. <laughs> you know, like it, oh, it's it, on LinkedIn, you know, you can, you can certify your friends or whatever that, yeah, this yeah. person knows Python or, or whatever. Yeah. You make exactly. It and by the way, you just said, said, look, okay, I didn't get the degree from Stanford but 10 Google engineers, right, who work in Python all say Reed's good at Python. Well, that's useful data. I mean, it may not be exactly the same thing, but it's, it's like when you're thinking, okay, who are the people that I might hire for do this? Well, that I should take this candidate seriously, right? So you have this very range, uh, broad range. And this is part of what I mean by like, how do you make technology part of the solution? You go, oh my God, we're changing this stuff. 
Well, just saying, hey, slow the technology down, slow down industrial pro progress. Well, other people are gonna be still getting those new products and services, doing the amplification, and then you get left behind. How is it you could say, no, no, we use technology to help solve the problem? Well, James, I, I'm gonna ask you a similar question, but I'm gonna make it a little bit harder for you because we're getting questions coming in now uh, from the participants. And, uh, and so we have one question which says, who says that, uh, it sounds like many jobs are changing so quickly that the training for any given job becomes obsolete before it's even completed. So how do we keep up? So, so now can you answer that harder question for us, James? Well, well I, think, I think part of the keeping up is uh, the idea of lifelong learning that everybody's talked about, but now it's really real uh, and we actually have to do it. Uh, by the way, I wanna build on something that Reed said, which helps answer this question as well, which is one of the remarkable things that LinkedIn does, in some ways it solves a, an information asymmetry problem. It solves a market signal problem, which is because you know one of the things that happens on LinkedIn is that it's much easier to keep up with how rapidly skill requirements are changing. Uh, so for example, if you looked at LinkedIn, you can actually see how either recruiters or employees are changing their own descriptions of their capabilities in much, much more real time. So the market signals about what skills are in demand, are in the market, is much, much, much more rapid. I just hope that, Reed, you expand LinkedIn even more so we actually cover all the occupations. Right, uh, it is beyond... right now to, to people like us disproportionately, but I know you're exactly. working. Exactly, but, but imagine if we had that for everybody, you'd have a much, much more real-time sense of what are the in-demand skills. So these market matching, skill matching, uh, you know, information asymmetries could be much, much more solved. But I think the lifelong learning is an important part of the solve per the question, which is we haven't as a society uh, invested or created enough incentives for on the job training. Uh, one of the things you could think about from a policy standpoint is we created all these enormous incentives for companies to, you know, uh, write off capital investments or R&D investments, which is wonderful. We should keep doing that. But we haven't done, you know, nearly as much on the side of human skills adaptation that we could do to encourage companies to invest in that as much, much, much more than they do. Yeah. yeah. A, so, so we in our tax system there, where you know human labor is taxed pretty significantly, but there's a lot of uh, of benefits for for capital, and, and 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 human capital is actually a much larger share of the economy, which is not measuring it very well and not investing in it the way we used to. And, and, and I think your point about asymmetric information is, is really important. I want to bring that up again, too. It's just that having these tools like LinkedIn and, and, and online job sites where you can get better matching. There's such, you know, you see in our economy so much of a mismatch of skills and of people to jobs, um, either that they don't have the jobs that are living, getting them to reach their full potential or with just a little more training, a little more skills, they could move to another, perhaps much more, um, not just lucrative, but job that, that adds more to society and makes us all better off. And, uh, and that these platforms for allowing better matching um, can really help a lot. We looked at some of the online job postings with, with Sarah Vanna and, and, Seb and uh, uh, Stefan and, and Daniel Rock, uh, about uh, 300 million online job postings. And we're able to see the skills that are percolating up just as you can at, at LinkedIn elsewhere. It's, a, it's an amazing uh, new tool for seeing what's going on in the economy. Right, exactly. But, but I think there are a couple of other either transitions that we need to adapt. So if the whole scaling question is a big one, the other transition that's important to manage is, you know, because remember we said there are some jobs that will grow, either because they're totally new jobs or we're expanding existing jobs and growing them. How do we help workers transition to those new jobs? So these kind of transition moving from one occupation to another, these redeployment, I mean, we're seeing it right now in this COVID moment. We know that, for example, some occupations related to delivery and transportation have actually grown, expand, you know, are expanding dramatically just to cater with the moment. How do we help those transitions happen much more smoothly? Again, job matching sites that signal demand can help with that. But here's the, here's the tougher set of transitions that we're gonna to need to think about much harder than this. It's the impact on wages. As, and what happens, because we know, for example, that one of the things that happens is our economy transitions and grows. We're creating more service sector jobs, uh, jobs in care work and so forth. And a lot of those occupations, at least at today's market economics, don't quite pay as well as the jobs that are declining. So I actually worry that we may have a surfeit of jobs, 
but just that in aggregate, they may not pay as well. So how do we think about how people learn, you know, earn a living wage? And how do we think about the wage supports uh, for people, uh, even, even as their jobs, even as those jobs grow and exist? That's a much tougher question. Let, let me add in two amplifications of what James is just saying, because I think they're they're super important and 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 you know part of uh, like what what shining a lens into the future and what we need to do is. So one is, you know, it, look, it could be that especially over interim periods where we go, look, th this is not priced the right way. We all we know a bunch of care jobs are not priced the right way. This is other different things where you go, look, this is this this is the market that mechanism is isn't fully working for for a variety of reasons, but isn't isn't working. Well, one of the things you can do is you can say, well, um, I think it's much better um, for the help of the health of society and say, well, okay, here, here are jobs that we know lead to other jobs. Here are jobs that are really important right now. And they're being paid through this network or marketplace. Let's amplify them a little bit, All right? So one example that I, I, I sometimes uh, illustrate is like, you have an entrepreneurship platform. I usually use the Airbnb magical trips as a way of doing this because it's 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 something other than LinkedIn, just so it doesn't look like I'm <laughs> I'm being self-interested in that way. And you say, well, people can be an entrepreneur by saying, hey, I'm gonna offer a cooking lesson or a violin lesson or a midnight tour of the of the city. And by the way, you know, part of the pivot during the pandemic is is Airbnb is doing this virtually, you know, virtual trips and experiences now, um, which is you know, again, network adaptation and part of what happens. You say, well, maybe it's not enough money. Well, what if we said for every dollar you make up to X dollars, we match it one to one and then two to one and so forth to, to kind of make it a little bit more because then you have a market demand for, for, for product and services that people actually want and, and to be used, right? And is adapting to that, but then you kind of amplify up the wage. And I think that's one thing that could be a portion of, 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 yes. of, of, of government policy and so forth and other things to, to, to keep people involved and working and on career paths and all the rest versus falling off. Cause that's one of the problems with like welfare and so forth. And then the second one is, and this is one of the things that I particularly hope that the digital economy lab will, will cause, cause all, all, all of you, uh, you big brains <laughs> working on this stuff is, um, you know, like how do we not just incent capital but incent human capital? Like when, when you create good jobs, middle-class jobs, whatever, that and and you're and you're increasing the human capital of skills and so forth that go to it. How do you get an economic benefit as a company, right? Or a benefit as a company in order to do that, that becomes part of the competition marketplace. Because then by having a network of doing the innovation, we are much more likely to be adopt, uh, adapting sooner and creating better outcomes. Yeah. Actually, can, can, can I build on Reed? Uh, since Reed started this trend of giving the digital lab assignments, because I love the fact that we've got <laughs> no, the digital lab the, working I on stuff. Assignments. It, one so, of the best things about this job is getting to hear what the challenges and opportunities people like you are, are facing, because because um, you know the best research is motivated by those kinds of questions, not from sitting in an office and, and, and just trying to think deep thoughts by myself. So, so, so let, me, let me give you one. Uh, it's the question of complements and substitutes. One of the things that happens, you know, one of, we know that all this works out well if, in fact, these AI and automation technologies complement work as opposed to substitute work. And one of the challenges we've had with this question of complements and substitutes is that if you think about how, you know, AI researchers typically think about the goals of what they're trying to do, and we've always used the idea of human capability as kind of the benchmark. Hey, yep. can I do image recognition better than a human? Can I do voice better than a human? We kind of use that as a benchmark. Well, that potentially runs the risk that in fact, what we do is we, we're more economically, at least we're more likely therefore to create technologies that are much more substitutive as opposed to complementary, as opposed to if we set different goals you know, that are not human bar or human kind of evaluated goals to say, what if I saw around corners? What if I did this? So I think the I question think is, as we shape technologies, is there a way to think about how do we create technologies and do related economic, uh, uh, you know, economics that go with that, that create more complements as opposed to substitutes so that, you know, we're substituting people. So I think this is a, a problem that's at the heart of both the AI research that happens at Stanford, but also the economics research that also uh, happens at Stanford. So I think this is a integrative problem I, we're on you know i know you and i've talked about it a little bit and, and you're lighting a fire under us to uh, to make sure we move on that I, i'll 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 put an economic spin on, on three of the things you all have has said lately and, and say each of these is is potentially a, a market failure where 
uh, compliments can create broad benefits for society, even if they create the same private benefits uh, that creating a substitute is. So there's, so we would like to you know, put our thumb on the scale to encourage people to create more complementary technologies instead of just substituting. Um, likewise, we'd like to encourage people to do more on the job training. Privately, it, it's not always optimal for a company to invest a lot in the skills of their worker. It helps them initially, but that worker, you know, they're free to go take those skills to another company. So the company doesn't capture the full benefits and that means they're gonna have an under incentive to invest as much as a society would like them to invest. So we're gonna have to you know, try to fix that market failure. And then on, on caregiving, again, I mean, uh, Bob Putnam uh, gave me this Good, good insight that he said that when people used to talk about our children, they talked about our children in the in our society, you know, what can we do for our children. More and more he sees them using it to just refer to their own families, nuclear families, children. And uh, there's, a, there's a failure there that yes, you know, we're altruistic, we want to invest in, in caregiving and helping children broadly. But again, if, if, we're, if, if those children are getting benefits 20 years into the future, there's not really an easy market mechanism for compensating the people. It's something we as a society has to do. But you can analyze many of these failures, as, as, at least I tend to do it this way as an economist, as you know, places where the traditional market system, wonderful as it is, isn't gonna solve the problem by itself without us thinking a little bit harder about how to uh, 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 fix it or intervene or, or, or uh, boost it in the direction that would create more, more broadly shared benefits. Can we add a few more, Eric? Please do. Well, here's another category. One of the things that we know, you know, we, we need to deeply understand is the impact of AI on the economics of data platforms and related, you know, issues, these questions of market power. We know that AI technologies, you know, uh, until we get to, you know, uh, where we don't need to do a lot of uh, uh, massive data, where we don't need massive training data sets, for now at least they rely on lots of data and aggregating and using a lot of data sets to do to do to train the algorithms. Mm -hmm. We also know that in fact there's massive benefits when if you, if you leverage the platform economics of these technologies. But it also these questions also raise questions about how do we think about the economics of data? How do we think about the economics of people's role in the production of data and their contribution to it? How do we think about the 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 kind of potential you know winner take most effects? of these technologies and the market power that comes with that. I well, think that's another question squarely that should be on the digital No, no, lab. it's definitely because, because as, as you suggest, the, the economics of data are just so different than the economics of atoms or, or physical interactions, economics of services. And so a lot of the very successful institutions we had for the, the 19th and 20th century don't translate into well into a digital economy. We're gonna have to, to invent some new ones, um, put hopefully ones that, that, that capture a lot more of these benefits. Um, we are just about out of time. I want to take a couple of questions here. And here's one that, that's a little potentially dangerous, but I think it might be interesting to, to pick up on. And, and that is that in an era dominated by political polarization and distrust of elites, how can we communicate these concepts in a way that they resonate with a broader population? You know, of course, we have an election coming up. Uh, a lot of these tools, we've been talking about some of the ways they can help economically, but there's also a whole uh, social, political uh, side to things. Um, in many ways, disinformation has gotten worse because of these platforms, um, and and distrust, uh, maybe maybe well founded, of some of the uh, people who have been providing, uh, you know, been been on these platforms. How do we how do we overcome that? Can technology be part of the solution, or is is it is it broader than that? Well, I think technology can be part of the solution, but I think ultimately. Um, part of what we need to do as a society is we need to have a, like it's important as a kind of a social good to have a broad set of belief and expertise, you know, expertise like science around pandemics, belief and expertise around, it doesn't mean expertise, like one of the good things about American culture is the occasional challenge of, of expertise, the, the, the challenge of new and different and, 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 and kind of what that creative disruption can be. So it's not like, you should just say everyone who's expert is that's truth of all time. We all know that you're constantly learning and that good experts are like, I know what I don't know. <laughs> right? um, but um, I actually think it's a society thing, which technology can amplify, but without society, I don't know if technology can do it on its own to say, actually, in fact, expertise is super important. It's important in medicine. It's important in science. It's important. In, and the fact that we have, through through some political mechanisms and the kind of the 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 the, the rise of populism 
um, allowed the the general attack. Like for example, the, the this this parody of hey, we're going to make a pandemic politicized versus what medical science knows, <laughs> you know, what epidemiologist knows, what public health expertise knows, uh, you know, like this whole like, well, I don't agree with Dr. Fauci. And you're like, well, wait a minute, you know, like he, he's doing a pretty you know, solid job against political pressure of truth telling. We all need to get there and we need to squash the political forces that are anti-expertise, right? And I, I dodge a little bit the elitism question. Obviously expertise comes with some elitism, but it isn't a bl blanket endorsement of elitism. How, how important is the role of technology in, in increasing the spread of misinformation? I, I have in mind, uh, for instance, a, a study by my uh, erstwhile MIT colleagues, Sanan Aral and Deb Roy, which found that uh, fake news or false information actually spread about three times faster on Twitter and other social networks. Um, in part or large part because it was just more sensational and more just like, wow, than boring old reality. Um, but, but the net effect was that, that these platforms perhaps unwittingly became um, amplifiers of a lot of misinformation. Yeah, I, uh, I think, go, go ahead, Reed. No, no, go James. No, I, I think, you know, uh, one suggestion I would have for people watching this is to watch a documentary called The Social Dilemma, which is quite provocative on these questions. Uh, but I think one of the things that uh, is, 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 a, is a real challenge is how we think about the business models for these technologies. Uh, because the questions about how the business mo models actually work is pretty fundamental because some of them, if they encourage the kind of levels of engagement and the kinds of separation of you know, people who are users from people who are actually the customers, that creates a dissonance which then you know, takes you down a slippery slope. So I think there's part of how do we solve for that the other part is also, I think, you know, back to your uh, populism and the political question. I think I agree with everything Reid suggested. I would also add that I think there's something to the idea of actually creating these things in a much more inclusive way. Because I think part of the charge, I think, about elitism or, or even when it comes to technology is the fact that pe often people don't feel included. And I mean included both in the creation of these technologies, but also in the economic outcomes like derived from these technologies. I think whenever people are not included in that way and don't get to participate in that way, I think it creates these kinds of distrust and dissonances as well. So I think we'd have to address, address that too. Well, thanks. I, I'm afraid, unfortunately, we're out of time. I just, I always learn so much talking to you guys. You just reminded me of that. You also reminded me, I think equally importantly, of how much fun it is to talk to you guys. So thank you for a very lively discussion. Thank you also for the homework and the to-do list. And I actually mean that sincerely. We're, we're very eager to hear that. And, and, and there, are, there are a number of questions in the uh, um, from the audience that we didn't get to yet, but I also encourage the audience to give, to give us their own, give us a to-do list as well. We, I'd love to hear what are the big challenges, the projects, the opportunities you'd like to see the Digital Economy Lab uh, work on. So thank you, Reed. Uh, thank you, James. It's good talking to you. I got to transition now to our, our next session.